Uh, my name is Peter Senge. Uh, I have historically been part of the Sloan School since I was a, a graduate student long ago. Um, and through most of that time, I was part of what's called the System Dynamics Group at the Sloan School, which is a general approach to understanding complexity and complex interdependent systems. Starting many years ago, actually in the, uh, in the 80s, I got more and more interested in, in, in not just the modeling and you might say the more pure kind of discipline aspect of understanding systems, but the use. Um, and so we, we formed a group of organizations, business organizations back then, uh, that was really focused on how do we integrate systems thinking and related skills. I'll say a word about that in a minute because I don't think you can do systems work well in isolation. It kind of is a part of a little bit larger set of developmental needs. Um, but how do you actually do that practically in businesses? That was a, 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 a network that grew uh, through the 90s. We eventually had something called the Organizational Learning Center at, uh, at Sloan uh, because we use this term organizational learning as this process whereby organizations over time could become more intelligent about the complexity both internally of their organization, but especially their situation in markets, industries, and societies. So how they understand the larger systems we saw is a profound learning process. Um, starting uh, in really 15 years or so ago, or almost 20 years ago, actually, I was quite pleased to see a lot of educators picking up the ideas uh, I wrote a book in 1990 called The Fifth Discipline, and by uh, five, six years after it came out, I had met lots of schools who were saying, gee, we at school, shouldn't that be a learning organization also? Shouldn't systems thinking be something that really starts upstream with, with the youngest of learners? Uh, that actually was a vision from the beginning of Jay Forrester, who founded the field. In fact, Jay spent the better part of the last 20 years of his life doing just that, you know, developing curriculum and working with teachers, particularly of younger children. Can you explain to us what a complex system is and what hmm. is systems thinking? Well, it's almost a funny uh, question because it's life. The archetypal system really is the family. We all grow up in families and we all develop our own kind of instincts about how to navigate the complex politics, personalities, conflicts, and all the wonderful things about families as well as all the problematic ones. Um, and so in many ways, family is the archetypal system. But we all grow up in systems. Uh, kids play on playgrounds. Kids live in communities, you know. Uh, you learn a lot walking to and from school or however you get there because you're in this intense social environment. Um, and that's really to point at, you might say, the social systems we live in. But those social systems sit within much larger webs of interdependence. I mean, there is only so much water on this planet. And it's pretty much the same water that's been here for probably a few billion years. Mm -hmm. It's one big system of water that moves in many different forms and changes over time, you know, wasn't that long ago in terms of geologic time that there was no ice on the planet, but it's pretty much the same amount of water. Um, and, and, similar, and so on and so on. You know, uh, what is climate change pointing out to us? Well, it, there is actually a system in the world that shapes the viability of, of, of atmospheric conditions, including temperature for this species. Climate change is not a big issue for a lot of other species because they don't depend on the same mix of gases. They certainly don't depend on the same very narrow temperature range that humans thrive in. It's a very big deal for us. So everywhere we look, we see the same fundamental kind of, you might say, aspect of reality, interconnectedness, it's profoundly interdependent. Traditional cultures, particularly native or indigenous cultures, cultures that live very, very close to the natural world, did not need a term for systems or systems thinking. The irony is, as we've kind of marched forward in the last few hundred years into the modern age, and we've become so disassociated from the larger natural world, now we like rediscover that things are all interconnected. You know, there's no one in charge of this forest. No one manages the water flow in the lake that I live on. 
you know, it kind of manages itself and it does homeostasis, all kinds of properties to maintain balances at the organismic level and at the ecological level are what allow life to exist. So the system as a whole has lots of stability sufficient for species like us to thrive, even though there's no one in charge. A model, so they better understand something, is one of the most high leverage approaches to learning. It's kind of what we're doing automatically in our mind's eye. We're always creating these little internal models. The problem is, of course, it's not very disciplined. It's private, not public, and it tends to go untested. So in the worst case, it just becomes a lot of biases. You know, I, I, I know what my parents say about those type of people, so it becomes a model in my head. Not the people. Literally, it's not the people. It's the set of assumptions, the picture, the image, the fears, the emotions. So modeling is, is a very natural process. I think that what, what I think none of us really appreciated was how if you bring in some of the simple tools for kids to construct more conceptual or explicit models, even simulation models, um, it's a tremendous pedagogy. Because all of a sudden now, I'm being acknowledged as an architect of my own thinking. Mm -hmm. In a human way, you might say the first problem of traditional education, we're trying to tell kids how things work rather than helping kids do their own thinking. So consequently, we end up with a lot of highly educated, stupid people who actually don't know how to think very well mm -hmm. because their whole education process was about absorbing a lot of information and basically getting indoctrinated, not becoming good critical thinkers. So that's what modeling is all about in the broadest sense. Now, in the systems field, of course, we all of us have had a lot of history with uh, simulation models as a way of, of helping kids see a little more rigorously how a system functions. Um, I have a good friend who created a 10th grade class. She's a science teacher, um, a math science teacher, and, and got so into how kids could build models to understand various science topics, that she, she created a whole 10th grade year class, year long class on model building. So helping kids build their own models. Pick a subject and you can start to build a model of it. Now, you have to have methodologies for doing that. There's a variety of different ones. There's different schools that have evolved over the last 40, 50 years. The system dynamics one that started here at MIT has always been my favorite because it's really very intuitive. And kids can really understand what the model they're building is telling them if, if, they're, if they give it some real thought and they have some good coaching. But it's the process of building models, I think, is, is really important. And the big insight of the last 20 years from an education standpoint has been what that means for a five-year-old or a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Now, at the age of five or six, they may not be building simulation models. What we find is often by the age of eight or nine, that's, that's very natural if they have the right kind of tools. Five, four, five, six, not really. However, they can be laying the foundation for that through starting to see that they can construct a representation of a situation that matters to them. Um, there's probably no video I've used more in the last several years than three six-year-old boys sitting around a table with a picture they drew to try to understand why they're having fights on the playground. Mm -hmm. And the picture is really simple. It's a simple reinforcing loop because they understand all about reinforcing loops and balancing loops. That's part of their education because they're in a school that does that. Mean words hurt feelings. And then teacher walked by, flipped over her phone and said, hey, would you explain this to me? And the little boy goes, ah, well, what we figure is first you have some mean words, then you have some hurt feelings. Then you have more mean words, then you have more hurt feelings, then you have more mean words, then you have more hurt feelings, then a fight breaks out. So they're understanding how the way they're interacting is creating what we would call an underlying structure. In this case, a simple self-reinforcing vicious cycle of mean words and hurt feelings. And then the, the kids now have a conversation and the teacher said, the teacher of statement says, so, so what? So what are you learning? And then one of the boys says, well, we're looking for all different ways we could intervene in the system. And you see on their picture, they've got some things drawn out. He says, well, we tried doing this but we don't think it has very high leverage. Saying I'm sorry kind of helps, 
But we're looking for where there could really be more leverage to really break this cycle because it's a cycle that we really don't want to be in. So that's a beautiful example, of not only individually, but collectively kids building a model to help them understand a very real situation that they're stuck in. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big, big believer that model building is in some sense, real learning. Make an impact on the systems I'm part of would be another way to define good systems education. And that continuum just goes on, you know, washing my hands in the present time and, and staying home and not mixing with people does have a huge impact in any of the epidemic models. You know, this is like the basics of this self-reinforcing cycle. It all revolves around contact and frequency of contact. So uh, I've seen quite a few things written in the last week or two, which is kind of novel, but I think absolutely right on, that making the choice to isolate myself right now is a profoundly compassionate choice. It's not just for my benefit, but it's for others' benefit as well. So it's a great example of how even on a larger scale, our individual choices really matter. Uh, the food we eat really matters, not just for us, but for the larger food system.